Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Now, historic films made in the spring of 1948 and just released show Enoita preparing for heavily guarded and still largely secret tests of new atomic weapons. The test's purpose is to measure atomic effects on thousands of different materials, 30,000 tons of them, not, as at Bikini, to prove military effectiveness. San Francisco police say that nine persons have been arrested in a narcotics raid on the headquarters of the Grateful Dead, a widely popular singing group. Two members of the group, Rod McKernan and Robert Weir, and their business manager, Danny Rifkin, have been booked on suspicion of possessing narcotics. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Well, strange lights are causing a viral buzz on YouTube. Could we have caught extraterrestrial activity on a recent newscast? Brandon Arroyo investigates. As the newscast ended, the controversy began back on September 26th. What is that light shining in the back of the dark night sky? With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now, Fate Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in Paranormal Talk Radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Fate Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to WBHM-TV, Birmingham, Alabama. I am Kat Hobson, your host of Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. My guest tonight is Lionel Friedberg, an Emmy Award-winning film and TV producer and also a writer. He grew up in South Africa and began his career at the first television station in Central Africa. It was in Northern Rhodesia, now Zambia. He worked as a director of photography on 18 feature films and wrote, produced, and directed for National Geographic, PBS, and national broadcasting cable networks including the Discovery Channel, A&E, and the History Channel. He is also a New York Times best-selling author. I have enjoyed so much getting a chance to read his new book. I think that you will love it too. The book is titled Forever in My Veins, How Film Led Me to the Mysterious World of the African Shaman. Lionel, I am so glad you're here. I cannot wait to talk about your book. Direct, he's pretty nifty. Lionel, I am, I am so excited that you're here. I am so impressed with your work. You have been in the film industry for, oh, what, 50 years, over 50 years. Yeah, I'm an, I'm an old guy now. I'm in my late 70s. So I've been in the film industry for over 60 years. 
And, uh, you know, I've been, we were talking, earlier, you know, you were saying that, um, you know, you feel very lucky to be doing what you do. And I have to reiterate that I feel extremely blessed and very fortunate to have had an amazing life. And, uh, you, you know, um, which is one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I just wanted to share some of those experiences with folks out there because in, not many people get the opportunities to do what I've had. And I'm not sure why and how all of those opportunities came about, but they did. And some of them were quite extraordinary, quite amazing, really. And they've expanded my vision of the universe, of the cosmos, of the world we live in, of of each other. And it's been an amazing journey. So I wanted to share that with folks, which is why I wrote Forever in My Veins. Um, and we can get into specifics um, if you like, uh, as to some of the things that uh, I cover in the book. Well, I would like that, but I'm interested in learning about the the shaman who prophesied about your life experiences down to and including when you started having the swelling issues and stuff. I mean, she was she was very dead on with everything that she told you. And I had a question for you also. Um, the word N-G-A-N-G-A. -N -G -A, how do I pronounce that? Well, in Zambia, which is where this event took place, which is in Central Africa, uh, shamans go by the name of Nganga. So she was okay. a, a, a Nganga. Um, however, most of the shamans that I refer to later on in the book, the ones I've had most of my experiences with in South Africa, they go by the name of Sangoma. And Sangoma basically means a diviner, a herbalist, uh, a, a traditional doctor, someone who can see into the future, someone who communicates with your ancestors, you know, is able to diagnose illnesses. They do all these amazing things. And a Sangoma wears many hats and has many capabilities, some of which are absolutely astounding. And, you know, I talk about some of the stuff in the latter chapters. But you asked me about this old lady, the first one that I met, which is basically the glue, if you like, that holds my whole story in the book together. Um, and let me just take folks back a little bit, um, uh, which put the, to put everything in, into context. I grew up, I was born and I grew up in South Africa. I went to school there. I completed my education there. Apartheid was alive and well. And for people who may know anything about apartheid, it was a, a system whereby uh, there was a, a very strict racial divide in society. Separate entrances, separate beaches, separate churches, separate banks, separate everything for black and white folks. It, the, the country was was cut right down the middle. And, uh, you know, the twain never met. You couldn't, you, not, the one side, of, of, of society really knew very little about the other side. And that pertained more to the whites than the blacks. The blacks were servants and they worked in, you know, white households and factories and farms and whatever else. But the white folks really knew nothing about their black neighbors. And the black people, of course, were by far the majority of the population. And it was kind of sad that we didn't know anything about their history or their culture or what made them tick and who they were and where they came from. You know, that wasn't taught in white schools. And so this is the world I grew up in. And it was kind of difficult, particularly after I finished high school. Um, I thought, you know, what am I going to do with my life? Um, I, was, mm, I was unhappy about that situation because I'd often seen black folks who were stopped by police in the streets just uh, for, for no reason other than to be asked to, to, to show whether they had permission to be where they were. Every one of them had to carry <clears throat> a document uh, stating why they were in a certain area, uh, you know, a white town or a city or, a, or a, a rural area or whatever it was. They had to have permission there, and this had to be renewed regularly. And if this was not up to date, if their papers or their passbook, as it was called, was not up to date, you know, they would face imprisonment. And eventually, if they weren't bailed out by their employer, they would be sent back to their tribal areas, which were way back in the boondocks, you know, in the rural areas, far away from the gold mines in the cities. And I'd seen that many, many times, and it disturbed me. So anyway, when I finished my education, I was an, an only child. <clears throat> my parents decided to leave the country because my father... Uh, took a job to manage a small store 
in a country way up to the north of South Africa, a place that was called Northern Rhodesia. Now, Northern Rhodesia is today known as the Republic of Zambia. And just to yes. put things in, into context, uh, for people to know what I'm talking about, it is it is sits right at the southern end of the Congo, the Congo Basin. So, you know, it's way up there in the middle of, of those days, what we used to refer to as darkest Africa. Well, today it's not as dark as it used to be because most of it has been explored. Most of it's been settled and there are cities everywhere now. But that's where Zambia is. But those days it was northern Rhodesia. And my father went up to run a small store in a town that was part of a copper mining area. So there were a whole bunch of these little towns in a string of them where there were copper mines. And he went up there to run a store. He's, he, he, by trade, he was a watchmaker in the days when, 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 when watches and clocks used to have mechanical you know, mechanisms, unlike today where most of it is electronic. And so he went up there and um, I have to tell you that I fell in love with the movies when I was a little tiny tyke because my mother used to drag me to every movie that she saw. I used to go to matinees with her on Saturday and sometimes on a Wednesday afternoon, and I fell in love with the movies. And all I wanted to do with my life was to make movies. So when they moved up to Northern Rhodesia, I'm finished high school now. I'm talking about the year 1960. Um, I said, I'm going with you. Um, and my mother said, you know, go to university, get yourself a degree you know, go and get a career. And I said, no, I want to go with you up there because that's exciting. That's darkest Africa. And I had my own little um, movie camera that I had already been using to make movies for my school sporting events and my friends' birthday parties and whatever else. And I thought, it's a very well, nice one. you know, here's the <laughs> chance for me to go up and make my own version of Tarzan and the African Queen and King Solomon's Mines and all those wonderful adventure films that I'd seen as a kid in the early 50s. I thought, now's my chance to do that. But I mean, what did I know? I was a teenager and I didn't know too much about that, but I had a movie camera and I thought, well, you know, I was going to find a career. Well, that was fanciful thinking. It reminds me of so many people who've, you know, come to Hollywood with a dream and, and left with their tail between their legs because it doesn't work out that way. It's not so easy. Uh, and I kind of had that same attitude. Who on earth was going to give me the opportunity to make movies in the African bush? Because that's virtually where I was going. So when I got up there and I discovered that you know, all that there was were a bunch of copper mining uh, mines and endless, endless jungles and bush spread out from horizon to horizon on either side. What on earth was I going to do with my life? But I had my movie camera. Anyway, um, to cut a long story short, one day in the local newspaper, there was a little, a little local rag that served um, these copper mining towns. It was called the Northern News. And in there was an ad that announced that a television station was going to be uh, built and was going to go into operation in 1961 and that they were looking for staff. And I thought, oh my word, somebody's been hearing my prayers. That's what I need to do. Anyway, the station was still being built, but I went and knocked on the door and I spoke to the guy who was recruiting staff. Now, most of the people who were gonna run this station either came from, from, from the UK, from England, or from, from, from other countries, you know, overseas, um, the, the key staff, the producers and the engineers and the directors and, and whatever else. But they were looking for staff for menial tasks, menial jobs, if you like, you know, a driver, uh, someone to run the props department and things like that. And I said, I'll do anything. I'll sweep the floors, whatever it is, you've got to give me a job. I've got to do this. And I, I was eventually given employment and I got a job at the station before it even went on the air. I helped them, you know, weld cables and, you know, do things like that to get everything ready. And in December 1961, we officially went on the air uh, um, and it was the first television station in Central Africa. And there I was um, working for them um, in the props department, taking care of props for, you know, for sets and things of that nature. But I was very, very impatient to get behind a camera. And one day I said to the manager, I said, look, uh, uh, you've got to put me behind a camera or I'm leaving. And he said, all right, well, we'll, we'll try you out. And uh, they did. And because I'd had so much experience as an amateur filmmaker, and I'd made some pretty good little amateur films, I can tell you, uh, without sounding boastful or arrogant about it, you know, I was pretty good behind that camera. And he said, yeah, OK. Uh, the, the manager said, yeah, all right, well, you, you can be a, you can be one of our studio cameramen. 
And that's really how my career began. Now, I was as happy as can be. I, it was absolutely wonderful. We had all kinds of programming that was coming out of the station. In the morning were educational broadcasts for local, mainly uh, African schools for local kids out in the boondocks where there was a shortage of teachers. You know, some of these schools were way out in the in the in, in the bush, far away from towns. And uh, so they all had one television set in the main hall of the school and kids would go there for for some of their lessons. And it was coming from our station. And in the afternoons, we would have we would have tribal programming for for villages all around the area of tribal music and dance. So we'd had educational broadcasts in the morning, all in local languages, some of it in English, but not all of it. And then we'd have these amazing local tribal programs in the afternoon with drumming and beating and dancing. And then at night, we'd have Leave it to Beaver and I Love Lucy and Bonanza uh, for the white uh, viewers. And, you know, so I lived in this, it was like a surreal world. We lived in many it's like cultures. like a dual, uh, dual yeah. cu multicultural yeah. world. Now, we had to break, we had to stop for a break right quick. But we will be right back, and I hope all of our listeners come too. And if you're if you didn't meet the game, shame on you. <laughs> you're missing this great show. But if you're listening after, I hope that you are just cheering on the Saints. We'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see the spirits will talk to you. And the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio, and my guest tonight is Lionel Friedman, Freeberg. Oh, Lionel, I'm sorry. And I'm going to tell you that I am really impressed with this man. Uh, his publicist, who is a friend of mine, 
and I'm going to share this Lionel because I think it's lovely, but it says Lionel is the man who brought us television shows such as Ancient Mysteries, Mysteries of the Bible, and History Mysteries for the Discovery Channel, History Channel, and National Geographic. His latest incredible book, which it is, brings us on an adventure of shamanism, near-death experience, interviews with the dead, UFO cat encounters, photographed, and strange paranormal encounters during his world travels as a Hollywood filmmaker. And Lionel, I know that I interrupted you in mid-stride, but I do want to note that you have... You have traveled and worked on all seven continents. You have been everywhere. I've been to all seven continents of the planet, yeah. And remember, there are seven continents, because if you exclude Antarctica, it's six continents. But if you include Antarctica, it's seven. And I've been yes. there, too. So, you know, so let me just pick up. So uh, yes. after three years, I was I, uh, this, uh, the country, this northern Rhodesia, gets its independence from Britain and becomes the Republic of Zambia. Now, the local people, correctly so, are now in charge of their affairs. And what they did was the government decided to nationalize the station, which was originally privately owned. And the minute that happened, we, all us white folk in the station, in the studio, we got little white uh, pink slips to say, thank you very much. You've done a great job, but bye bye in six months out of here. You know, your jobs are going to be taken over by local people. Well, we couldn't argue with that because it made absolute sense, but it was a little horrifying because I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And we had a guy working for us at home. We all had servants still in those days. He was a, a young guy, not very much older than I was. I was about 22 at this point. And I told him about it. And he said, oh, we have to find out what you should do with your life. Because I told him, I don't want to go back to South Africa, even though South Africa had a really good film industry, even then. But I didn't want to particularly go back to South Africa. Apartheid was still alive and well. And, 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 and you know, that was the rule of the land. I didn't want to do that. I wanted eventually to end up in Hollywood which is where I now live, thank goodness, and I eventually got here. But at that time, what do I do? So he said, I will take you to somebody who will tell you what to do. And I had no idea who this somebody was, but I trusted him implicitly. And he said, on Thursday afternoon, we take your car and I will take you to this person. So we did on that Thursday afternoon. There we are driving my little secondhand used car. It was a VW Beetle. It was blue in color. And we went driving into the bush on a little dirt road and we went to a settlement and there was a single little tiny house on the edge of the settlement. And David went and knocked at the door and this little old lady, this little old Bemba woman, she was a member of the Bemba ethnic group. She answered the door and it was a hot, hot day, but she was covered in a trench coat and a, a rug, you know, and she, she beckoned us into her little house. And the minute I went to this house, there were strange smells. It was a very, very weird ambiance that wasn't disturbing, but it wasn't familiar to me. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but the vibe inside that place was very, very strange and unfamiliar to me. And we sat down on the floor and there was a grass mat. She spoke no English, but David, my, you know, this guy who took me there, our, our servant, he translated for me. And what she did was she had a little bag of, of, uh, of, of a little African, a skin, an animal skin bag, which she picked up and she shook it and she handed it to me and she told me, speak your name into the bag, which she spoke in Bemba. David told me what to do, which I did. And then she sprinkled some snuff into it, which is ground up uh, tobacco leaf. And then she poured the bones onto this grass mat and the way the bones fell, it made a pattern. And she leaned over and she looked at those bones and she basically foresaw Everything in my life and everything that she told me that day came true over the period of the next six decades. It was unbelievable. That is unbelievable. It's um, so neat. Uh, to the degree of, you know, how many kids I would have, how many grandchildren I would have, she, uh, and oh. all, all kinds wow. of stuff. She was that accurate. So I don't know how much time you have before you have your next break, but I want to We've go got on. about to give, 10 minutes. I want to give you an example of some of the things she told me. And I didn't understand any of it, but I, I made notes and I made mental notes as well as physical notes in a little notepad. But, you know, she said to me things like, one day you will go to a world where there is no color. It's only white. No colors there at all. Just a white world. You will go there. And she said, you will one day go far over the big water and you will go to a place where there are many, many lights 
and you will work with many, many famous people. And she said, one day you will be in the bush and you will almost get killed by a great beast. None of this stuff was, was making any sense to me, as you can well imagine. And I don't think it was making any sense to her either. But these are the images, these are the scenes that she was seeing in this pattern of bones lying on the floor. So she was you know, just looking at the bones to bring that to you. Yeah. And she was wow. just describing these visions that she was having, you know, and she said to me, even weird things like, for example, one day the big water will almost kill you. And the, the, the weirdest thing that she said to me, which I, which I think is one of the most extraordinary stories, is she said to me, um, again, through the translator, through Dave, uh, David, she said, you will meet a man one day who was very, very close to the most evil man who ever lived. That fascinated me. You know, and when she said that, I kind of got a, a little nervous and very edgy because I had no idea what, what she was inferring. What on earth was she referring to? I had no idea. But as I explain in the book, all of these things did come to pass. Every single thing that she told me came true. You will, you will cross the big water. You will go to the north. You will work in the big lights. Yes, I immigrated from South Africa. I went by sea. She didn't even know what the ocean was. She'd never seen an ocean, this poor old, this little old lady living in the bush. She, she was referring to the, to the ocean. Oh, that's true. I would, I missed that. Wow. Yeah. She was referring to the ocean, you know, and I did go to the north because I went all the way from Cape Town all the way to the northern hemisphere. And where did I end up? Well, in my life ended up eventually in Hollywood. And what are the big lights? Well, these are the sound stages of Hollywood. Yeah, you know, lots of lights and lots of famous people. Well, that's what I've done. And, you know, the, the thing about the, uh, the white world is that 1991, as part of a science series that I did for PBS, I was sent on a scientific research trip to Antarctica. And um, uh, it, it was quite amazing because it was the southern hemisphere in summertime. The sun doesn't set down in the Antarctic because, you know, the sun never goes beneath the horizon. And uh, it was Christmas Eve 1991 and we on this icebreaker in the middle of an ocean that is covered with pack ice. So there's white everywhere. And the sky was white and the world was white and the sea was white and everything was white. And I was sitting on the deck of the ship just thinking about it, making my notes of the filming that we'd done that day. And it suddenly hit me again. My God, this is what this woman foresaw. You will go to a world where there is only white, no color. She had foreseen that. You know, um, and let's talk about the one that I found most strange, you know, about this. this you will meet a man who was yes. close to the most evil man who ever lived. Well, back in 1983, I did a, a really terrific series of documentaries on the history of South African Airways, which is one of the oldest airlines in the world and one of the one of the world's great airlines. It flew all over the world from South Africa. Um, it was originally formed in 1929, a private airline, and it was called Union Airways at the time, but it ran out of money. And in 1934, the government you know, had to bail it out and it was renamed South African Airways. And in 1983, it celebrated its 50th anniversary. And in the course of our research into the history of the airline, we had found that in 1934, the airline had ordered a, 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 a bunch of brand new aircraft from a company in Germany. And the company in Germany was called the Junkers Airplane Company. I think they were based in uh, in Bremen, if I, if I remember correctly. Now, this is the early 30s. How do you fly an airliner, even though it only sat 14 people, it was still a big airplane. How do you fly something like that all the way from Europe, all the way down Africa, to Johannesburg. There are no airfields. There are no uh, weather forecasting stations along the way. There's no radio. You know, how do you do that? And how do you refuel the aircraft en route? All of this had to be pre-planned and done. The trip took two weeks for these delivery flights to take place. Oh, so God. that in itself was a major adventure. And what we found as we did our research was that one of the pilots on one of these delivery flights was still alive. And I said, oh, wow, we got to interview this guy. And it turned out that he was retired. He was in his late 80s, almost 90. And he was living in a little tiny village near Munich in Bavaria in Germany. But not only that, we had found out that he had shot a whole movie himself of that delivery flight. And I said, we've got to find that footage. No I've got to use it. You know. So we found out that, that, that a copy of his film was in a lab in Frankfurt. And so, I mean, you know, can you imagine my excitement? 
when we eventually got to Germany and we st we were did finished our filming doing various other things in Germany, we eventually ended up in Frankfurt. We find the film, we select up the, the the parts that we want to use in our in our documentary, and uh, and and from Frankfurt to Munich is. Uh, quite a distance but you can drive there non-stop on those amazing german autobahns which we did it took a day to get there and along the way you know there were two 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 vehicles with the crew and the publicity crew and whatever else and one uh, there was a man from the german government who was going to be my translator and who was facilitating this interview with this guy and um <clears throat> you know they were being very nice and very helpful to us so we eventually get to the little village where this man lives and it was the night before the interview was scheduled to take place. And we're all staying in this very nice little hotel. And this guy from the government, the German government, the foreign office, he, you know, came up to me at about, we had a very good dinner together and then a lot of wine flowed and we had a good time that night. And, you know, in the middle of like maybe midnight, he said to me, how much do you really know about this man that you're going to interview tomorrow? Now, I knew his name. His name was Hans Bar, B-A-U-R. He said, but, you know, how much do you really know about him? And I said, well, you know, not, the only thing I'm, I'm interested in is about that amazing delivery flight of those brand new airliners that were flown down Africa. That's what I want to talk to him about. And he said, yeah, but, you know, he had a, there was a history behind him. And I said, well, I'm sure there was, you know, and why? And he said, he leaned over to me and he said, do you realize that he was Adolf Hitler's personal pilot? Well, you can imagine Astounding. when I heard that, um, you know, I instantly sobered up after all of this great German wine and I thought, oh my word, how am I going to deal with that? How many times do you get an opportunity to meet someone like that? I've, I've interviewed and met tons of people all over the world in my time, but that guy, I really felt nervous before that interview because I wasn't sure how I was going to handle it. Anyway, the That's next day came and we that met. That would be the one. Uh, well, you know, I mean, you can imagine um, Adolf Hitler was one of the, the greatest mass murderers yes, in he history, was. more so than Genghis Khan could ever be, you know, responsible for the death of millions of people. Yes. And Literally. now I'm going to meet a man who was his personal pilot, um, who must have known him extremely well. They must have had some degree of, you know, relationship, uh, friendship. Uh, what am I going to, you know, how do you do that? Anyway, the next day we go to his house and, uh, you know, we meet him uh, after a while. And the minute I shook his hand, I suddenly realized I was one handshake away from Adolf Hitler. How many times had, had, did Adolf Hitler shake that very hand that I have just shaken now? It sort of sobered me up and it really yes, made me aware of the fact that, wow, you know, call about, talk about six degrees of separation. This is one degree of separation, you know. <laughs> yes, that is so, when you place it in that context, it takes a whole different persona. Absolutely, yeah. Just so bizarre. not only not only did we do this interview with him, but at the end of the interview, he, you know, he was, he invited me to sit down with him and he started showing me all his photograph albums. And in these albums were endless pictures of him with Adolf Hitler. First of all, he and Adolf Hitler were friends from way, way back when he got married his first wife. This is his third wife that was living with him at the time. When he married his first wife, Adolf Hitler gave him his wedding party in Adolf Hitler's personal apartment in Munich. So they were close buddies right from very, very early days. And during the course of, you know, going through these albums, he told me that he and Hitler were extremely close during the war. Hitler trusted nobody. He always felt that his life was in danger. He always felt that the people were after him. And there were many attempts on his life, as we now know. But he and Hans Bauer were always the best of friends. And he always made place at his you know, dinner table, even if it was a state dinner with someone like Mussolini or whoever. He always made space for, for, for Hans Bauer to be there as well. That's how tight these two guys were. He was with Hitler the night Hitler was in the bunker, the night Hitler took his life in Berlin. You know, and it was just an amazing e afternoon to hear this firsthand from a guy who experienced that. And you know what? It was only after we were driving away from his little house, which is like a picture book house. Um, and he, there he was standing outside his house with his wife, two little old people waving goodbye, you know, like an old couple waving good guy, goodbye to their grandchildren. And they was as sweet as can be to us. It suddenly struck me again. 
that's what that old woman in that hut in Africa yeah. had seen decades earlier. I will meet the man who knew the most evil man who ever lived. Once again, she was right. Well, I tell you what, the things that I have already read that she was right about are just phenomenal. But we do have to take a break. We will be right back. Y'all come back too. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Kat Hobson Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. And welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I am just loving this conversation, and I, I just think you know, I always tell people. One of these days, somebody is going to start recording the breaks between, you know, during the shows, and it's not going to be me to share them, but it is so cool because you get even more information that way. I love when I get to talk to someone who has done all the things that I find fascinating. What I really found interesting is this did not come from Gavin, your publicist. This is from you, but life and your career have taught you that the planet is history. Indeed, the universe is far weirder and infinitely more complex, surprising and amazing than we can ever imagine. Absolutely. I think that's my favorite quote from you so far. Yeah. You know, uh, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. In fact, uh, at the end of the book, when folks, if folks get to the end, and I'm not giving anything away because I'm not, you know, it's not like a plot, but, but at the very end of the book, I basically say that, you know, we're all connected, every single one of us, we're all connected, whether we are a person or a pony or a petunia, it doesn't matter. We are all I connected by some kind of invisible grid on a cosmic scale. We all share a connection with one another. We're all interlinked in some weird, unbelievably complex and amazingly exciting um, force field, if you like, you know. George Lucas got it right in Star Wars, you know, use the force, Luke, use the force. There is the force. There, there is, is such a thing. Yes. There really, there really, really is. And I've met so many people who have had experience, you know, who've right. been clinically dead and who've oh. actually traveled outside their bodies. Yes. Um, I people, love this. People oh. who have had. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I work, there's a, there's, a, there's a remarkable institute in Virginia called the Monroe Institute. I don't yes. know how many folks have heard about it, but basically what, what they do there is raise your level of consciousness. And, and that's what it's all about. We all need to raise our level of consciousness above the everyday, you know, just above the gray everyday world that we live in. You know, it's more than just, you know, getting through the day. Keep your mind alive and try and extend it to a realm. However many realms you believe exist, go there, try and find them. And um, at the Monroe Institute, they have the capability of doing this by 
stimulating consciousness through sound waves. And they have had some of the most fascinating people go there basically to unwind or to learn to relax or to just, you know, extend their level of consciousness. And there was a rocket scientist, a guy from NASA who went there and I interviewed him and he said, you know, I'm a nuts and bolts guy. I don't believe in any airy fairy, you know, ooga booga things that go bump in the night stuff. I've got to have proof of everything. And I have had it right here in this institute during my experiences. When I have raised my consciousness with these binaural sound signals that, 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 uh, that people are able to experience there, I have traveled beyond my body. I've gone outside my body. I have gone outside of the solar system. I have gone beyond the, to the furthermost reaches of the universe. And I've met my grandfather. And, you know, and, in, and I said to him, how do you know you met your grandfather? And he said, well, I talked to my dad about it. I, I said, I described this guy. And this is what he looked like. And my dad said, yeah, that was my dad. That was my dad, you know? Um, so That's it's, wild. It's, I, I'm not throwing all this stuff out uh, because um, people have said so. I don't go on hearsay. I will only quote people because I'm a documentary filmmaker. You've got to have facts. You've got to have proof. You've got to substantiate things and you've got to also rationalize it in a way that makes it acceptable to people because you are offering them tangible proof that these things really do exist. And it doesn't matter what the subject is. That's what you have to do. And this guy was a typical example of that, you know, that he had met his ancestors in astral travel there but i've met other people who've done this you know we can all maybe even when we're dreaming we are able to connect to this field and i think that that is the case because in my own case i know that i have gone places that uh, I, I i cannot explain but they certainly are not in this world or of this world you know i've met people um who who have died clinically and floated above their bodies and looked down and seeing sur uh, surgery being performed on them that have brought them back to life again and described everything that happened because they went outside their body and they eventually were given a choice by either a, a light being or a voice or a something or a someone or a some it, whatever it was, to give them the option of going back into their bodies and being resuscitated and being brought back to life again as, for the, as the person who they were in their physical being, in their physical uh, bodies. Um, there was an amazing woman in Atlanta uh, who told me her story. She had an aneurysm on the brain. She traveled outside her body because they had to stop her heart. They had to stop her blood flow in order to open her skull and get rid of the aneurysm. And then they brought her back to life again. And she described the entire surgery to the surgeon afterwards. And, he, you know, he didn't believe a word of it until she said, yeah. And then she described things that he did. She even said, and what about the time when you, when you asked the nurse for a certain instrument and she dropped it and you scolded her? He said, you saw that? She said, of course I did. Why were you so nasty to her? And she was dead when that happened. <laughs> oh, my word. Well, you know, I, I am fortunate enough to have gotten a chance to speak with Dr. Raymond Moody, who you know, coined the, ter the term near-death experience. And it's amazing how universal the experiences seem to be. There's not a lot of variation. Exactly. At yes. all. And so that's why it it's almost makes it conclusive. Well, uh, Kat, how much time you got? You got got enough for me to tell you a little story? You got uh, about eight minutes. Okay. What, the most amazing thing about all of these people that I have that I interviewed in a show that I called Beyond Death, this was about 1998, and I don't remember the channel I made it for. It was for here. Um, it was for either A&E or the History Channel, one of those. Um, it was called Beyond Death. And, you know, and, and the brief was, go and find out what happens to human consciousness or the spirit, if you like, after the demise of the physical body? In other words, what happens to your soul and all your thoughts and everything that defines who you are when your body's dead? That was what the show was about. So I went to all these institutions and whatever else. But one of the most amazing things during the course of the making of that series was meeting a pediatrician who dealt with children. He was based in Seattle. I think he's still in practice in Seattle. And he dealt with children, small children, and I'm talking about kids at the age of about five, six, seven years old, maybe eight, uh, who were clinically dead and revived, brought back to life again. None of these kids knew each other, but th this guy um, collected a file on all of these kids because people knew about him and would refer their patients or their experiences to him. And he made a collection of all of these kids' experiences. And I interviewed three of these kids. 
And he, he said all of these children had similar experiences when they were dead. They would say things like, oh, yeah, um, I, I, I went to sleep and then there was this tunnel and this tunnel was very bright. It was a tunnel of like light. And at the end, there was this big, bright room and I could go in there. And then there, some of the kids called them angels. Some of them called them doctors in white coats. Some of the kids said, yeah, there was Jesus there and there were other people with him. Some of them said, oh, no, there were scientists, you know, but they all described these figures in this rather large space. And they were given an option by these beings to go back through that tunnel of light to return to where they came, came from. They didn't know that they were dead. They were given an option to go back to where mommy and daddy is or to stay where they were. And all of them who said, no, I want to go back. They said, all right, then you've got to go back through that tunnel of light, go to the end and jump. And that's what they did. And it's the, at that moment is when they were, they were resuscitated and they came back to life again. And, you know, um, one little child, little girl, she was absolutely amazing. This message comes from NPR. She described perfectly that she actually met her grandmother in this room together with all these people in the white coats. And her grandmother said, no, you got to go back because mommy is missing you. you got to go back. You can't leave mommy alone. And when she went back and she woke up from the surgery, uh, she was revived in the operating room. You know, she eventually met her mother. Uh, she said to her mother, mommy, I met granny. And her mother said, how can you meet granny? Granny died before you were born. You know, and she described granny. And the way she described this woman was exactly the way this woman's mother looked. She described her grandmother. And her grandmother said, go back to mommy. Mommy's missing you. And she'd never met this woman, you know. Oh, my gosh. Well, what this was her mom's reaction? Well, I mean, can you imagine? Shock. I can't. And, uh, I mean, there are there are there are other stories uh, that I tell in there. There, there. there were two women whose each one of them had a teenage son. And the one woman, each of them dreamt about the other woman's son in their dreams. And it was a very complex uh, way that these two women were eventually put together again. And when they met, I photographed their meeting. They're getting together. Uh, a, a psychic got them together because they heard this. This guy heard about their stories. They were each dreaming about the, each other's son, and they had seen in their dreams the two boys together. So in other words, these two kids who had died, one in a motorcycle accident and the other one in an operating room from some ghastly illness or injury, had made friends in the spiritual realm and were having dreams. And these two mothers were dreaming the same dream. And, you know, we had cameras there. And when these two people met, it was just absolutely incredible. Then they compared photographs of their two boys together for the first time. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I've met him. That's your son. He came to me in my dream. I'm, that's exactly how he looked. Yeah, that's him. That, you know, so there's no. That is and, so you know, bizarre. It's not only about um, being in Western societies. I've come across this even in, in tribal societies and in rural societies. Because, you know, when you deal with um, the, the, tri tri the uh, tribal people in Africa, the, 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 the whole concept of, of, of spirituality and religion is all based around the ancestors and your ability to communicate with the ancestors. Everything is about the ancestors. You get healed. This you, message you comes. You are given information. You are given good fortune. And it's always through the ancestors. And the medium that these people use, the shamans, the sangomas, are by throwing the bones. Because the belief is that the ancestors influence the way these bones fall on the floor. And then these shamans, these sangomas, interpret the pattern as being events because the ancestors, once again, are speaking to them, telling them stuff, you know. <sighs> It's that is so bizarre. Yeah, it's amazing. But in the very best way. Yeah, and, and you know, um, and there's no arrogance about it. Some of these people are the sweetest people imaginable. They go sit at the foot of, uh, of, of a wise, older person and learn their craft over a period of years. And, you know, they go away um, ordained into these crafts and into these arts. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing. They don't go to university. A lot of them, you know, can't even read. And today, that version, that, that type of healing is officially recognized in South Africa as part of the medical system. That's how much respect it is given today. My word, and, really? Yeah. In the days of apartheid, of course, you know, people who did that were regarded, oh, that's just another witch doctor, you know, absolutely disparaging and uh, arrogant. Today, it's a different story entirely.
they are respected for what they are and it's about time they get that degree of respect because they're extraordinary people i know unfortunately i know homeopathic medicine is so important i have i have been helped by it when i got tired of a, you know a health thing that wasn't getting better and um Oh, yes. April in chat says she was just going to say psychology blows the stuff off as crazy. Yeah, of course. Truly, it does. Well, you know, I you know. can't interrupt big pharma and, you know, all That's the right. other things. That's right. But what do you think out of all of the, the healings? And I know that we're going to get to yours in the second hour as well. But, um, what do you think the percentage is of the people there who actually utilize that, that field of medicine now that it's available to them? Um, among white society, very few, although it is increasing now that apartheid has gone and that South Africa is now a, an open, free, democratic society. Uh, which took place once Nelson Mandela was released from prison. It's now had 20 years of of uh, of uh, f free of racism. It's gone one of, by the way, South Africa is one of the most um, uh, embracing and uh, uh, um, r I think amazing constitutions in the world that protects the right of everybody. Enshrined in the constitution of South Africa today is the right to choose your to choose your partner and, you know, um, be, uh, be you, whether you're gay or straight or whatever. It is enshrined in the constitution. No other society on the planet has that. Many, many other societies in, in Africa and certainly in countries like the Middle East and so on, you know, if you're gay or you're lesbian or whatever, you frowned upon. In South Africa, it is enshrined by right, by law. That is how um, enlightened that country has become after those many, many dark years of divisive racism that defined everything and the way people behaved. Um, it's a complete turnabout, and it's, it's so refreshing to go there. The problem is that there's a lot of crime in South Africa at the moment because unemployment is high, and you know, the COVID has just made a mess of everything as it has all over the world. And please, let's just get through this COVID pandemic because we Absolutely. really need... We really need help with this. And I think we all need to start tapping into higher realms to help us to get through this dark period. In a way, maybe the, the pandemic came to teach us all a lesson. We've not been treating planet Earth very well. We've been very, very brutal to the planet that is our only home. We've been, uh, we've been brutal to the environment, the way we've been poisoning the earth, the way we've been chopping rainforests down and burning them down, the way we've been exploiting the planet, the plastic in the oceans, the acidity levels. I mean, you know, we've just been, and also a, a thing that is a pet project of mine is the way we've been treating wildlife and animals yes. gen generally uh, is just absolutely horrific. In You know, f factory farming and the industrialized side of agriculture, and I know I'm speaking just, you're in Alabama, so, you know, you're that's, there's a lot of agriculture that goes on there and what goes, and here in California too, you know, people think, oh, California's all about the aerospace industry and, 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 and Hollywood movies and music. It's not. The biggest part of the, of the Californian economy is agriculture. Yes. So I know we're also an agricultural state over here. And the way animals are treated as part of the agricultural system is just appalling, the cruelty that goes on, the way we um, treat them. Um, it's just shocking. And I think the day will come when we look back upon this period as being a very, very brutal, vicious, uh, vicious one. And, you know, we'll, we'll regret what we've done. And maybe this pandemic is part of learning that process. I don't know. I would like to think that that is the case, because if you think about it, if the virus really did start in that awful so-called wet market in Wuhan in China, where they sell everything from, you know, lizards yes. to, you know, whatever, all kinds of innocent animals. And some of these animals are killed in the most vicious and brutal ways. Uh, you know, I think that we have to rethink the way we get on with our neighbors and our neighbors aren't only human. There are other critters as well. That's right. We got to start respecting them. Well, I totally agree with you, but we have to take our five, our top of the hour break. 
And everyone who listens regularly knows that this is our news break, and I apologize. But, you know, I am ever hopeful that we're going to have good news. I am just constantly on the watch for that. So let's see what we find here. We will be back after this, and I hope that you This message comes from NPR sponsor Geico. Do you own or rent your home? Fortunately, Geico makes it easy to bundle your home and car insurance. It's a good thing, too, because having a home is hard work. Go to geico.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. Live from NPR News, I'm Janine Herbst. There's unprecedented security at state houses across the country ahead of President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration later this week. But as NPR's Eric Westervelt reports, threatened pro-Trump demonstrations didn't materialize today in most capitals. Small groups of pro-Trump protesters, some heavily armed, gathered Sunday outside state houses in Oregon, Michigan, Ohio, and South Carolina. Those gatherings were small, peaceful, and short-lived. Most state capitals were largely quiet Sunday, despite FBI warnings that white supremacists and anti-government extremists might target them. Many state house complexes posted a heavy presence of police and National Guard forces. At least 19 states deployed guard troops after an insurrectionist mob overran the U.S. Capitol January 6th. The atmosphere remained remains tense ahead of Joe Biden swearing in on Wednesday. Washington, D.C. remains under extraordinary security. Eric Westervelt, NPR News. The Justice Department says it's arrested an elected official from New Mexico on charges related to the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Coe Griffith, a New Mexico County Commissioner and founder of a group called Cowboys for Trump, was arrested in Washington. Authorities say he vowed to travel to D.C. with weapons to protest the inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden. Kremlin critic and opposition leader Alexei Navalny has been arrested at a Moscow airport. As NPR's Barbara Sprunt reports, Italy, France and the incoming Biden administration are calling for his release. In a statement on Twitter, Jake Sullivan, Biden's pick for national security advisor, called for Navalny's immediate release and said the perpetrators of the attack on his life must be held accountable. Navalny was returning from Berlin, where he had spent the last five months recuperating from being poisoned by what health authorities say is a variant of a Soviet-era nerve agent. Sullivan wrote, quote, The Kremlin's attacks on Mr. Navalny are not just a violation of human rights, but an affront to the Russian people who want their voices heard. Russian President Vladimir Putin has said Navalny poses a threat to national security, but denies that he was poisoned. Barbara Sprunt, NPR News. Health regulators in Brazil approved two COVID-19 vaccines for emergency use, NPR's Philip Reeves reports. Brazil has 209,000 COVID deaths, a second wave and a new strain of the virus. Yet its vaccination program has been delayed by political infighting and undermined by the president, Jair Bolsonaro, who says he won't be vaccinated. Bolsonaro's particularly scoffed at the vaccine Coronavac, pioneered by his political rival, the governor of Sao Paulo, in partnership with China. It's now been cleared for use. That means Coronavac will be going into Brazilian arms when vaccinations begin this week, because the government doesn't yet have any AstraZeneca, the other vaccine now approved by regulators. You're listening to NPR News. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris plans to resign her Senate seat tomorrow, two days before she and President-elect Biden are sworn into office. That clears the way for California Governor Gavin Newsom to appoint Democrat Alex Padilla to serve the final two years of Harris's term. Padilla is currently California Secretary of State. He will be the first Latino senator from California, where around 40 percent of the population is Hispanic. The U.S. Census Bureau is asking some households around the country about whether they plan to get a COVID-19 vaccine. NPR's Hansi Luang reports the Bureau is trying to collect the information for a voluntary survey about how the pandemic is affecting people's daily lives. If you get a text message or an email for a Census Bureau survey about the coronavirus, you may be asked, have you received a COVID-19 vaccine? Do you plan to receive all required doses? Those are some of the newest questions added to the Household Pulse Survey. That national online survey has been tracking how the pandemic is affecting people's finances, mental health, and access to health care. Now the Bureau is trying to figure out why people may decide to get vaccinated or not as the rollout of vaccines continues to ramp up. Results from the survey will be released every two weeks starting late this month. Anzi Luang, NPR News, New York. 
In Amsterdam, riot police used water cannons to disperse protesters who were taking part in banned demonstrations against the Dutch government over its tough coronavirus lockdown. Police say they took that action because the protesters weren't social distancing. I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News. Support for NPR comes from Intercom, presenting this message. Customer support doesn't have to be chaotic. Intercom's Resolution Bot resolves 33% of support tickets automatically for happier customers and more efficient teams. Now we're talking. More at intercom.com slash support. Hello there. It is five minutes after the hour and you are listening to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. We are the online voice of Fate Magazine and I am Kat Hobson, your host. Before I go any further in this, I have to give a shout out to Charlene Cadden Power in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Happy birthday to you. I am so happy to know you. And I hope your day has been worthy of a woman of your stature. So, love you. I am so enjoying this conversation. My guest tonight is Lionel Friedberg. He is, um, well, he's a little bit of everything. (laughs) He is a writer, producer, director. He is an author. He has... um, done all kinds of work. He's worked for Discovery and History. He has written a new book, Forever in My Veins, He, which is brilliant, I'm just going to tell you, and you can get it February 2nd. So I would be looking into that were I in your shoes. He is part of the reason, well, actually, the man who brought us television so shows like Mysteries of the Bible, Histories, Mystery. I actually love History Mysteries. Um, Discovery, History, National Geographic, a and E. I I mean, everywhere. Discovery. And I am so thankful, Lionel, that you have joined me tonight. We started off a little rough, but it's just perfect now. And we have some things to get to. And we are going to talk about the lake. And you are going to continue. Um, we are going to cover your your health issue that was also prophesied to you. And where do you want to start? Why don't we uh, look at the, the the lake story? Because we've had this technical glitch at the beginning of the show right. tonight, and it sort of resonated with me because uh, it reminded me of you know technical glitches are are nothing new. Uh, you know I've been filmmaker for years and technical glitches are always things that you you have to deal with so i i felt for you at the beginning of the show where you were dealing with those that you know came along to challenge you tonight but you got through them and you fixed them and everything's back and everything's up and running and that that's great so everything's fine and dandy now but it reminded me of an event that happened in the 70s i was doing a series of of documentaries that looked at the cultures of some of the predominant tribes tribal groups, if you like, ethnic groups would be a, a, a more correct word to use, ethnic groups in South Africa. There, South Africa <clears throat> has 11 official languages. That gives you an idea how many different tribes there are. And each one has, has their own language, but most people speak English, of course. But anyway, um, in the 70s, I was doing a series called The Tribal Identity, which looked at the main tribal groups. And, and it was absolutely fascinating because for the very, very first time, we could bring to white audiences, white viewers, a little bit of an insight into the cultures and traditions of their black neighbors and who these people really were and where they came from and what their practices were and what their belief systems were and their initiation rites, and of which there are many. Some of them are so colorful, and I describe a lot of them in the book uh, for, for both males and females in the tribal areas. Mm-hmm. You know, at the basis of all of these initiation rites, which take many, many forms, but at the bottom of it lies the essence of respect, how to respect your family, your parents, and your marital partner eventually, and how to be responsible uh, uh, citizens and responsible parents. All of this is taught to young folk uh, in the bush in various uh, ways. Um, 
and I described some amazingly colorful ceremonies. I'm not sure whether they all uh, still continue today, because that's 40, nearly over 40 years ago, and things might have changed. But <clears throat> one of the things that we were doing, we were working with a tribal, a tribe in, in the northern part of South Africa called the Venda, V-E-N-D-A. Now, they really are amazing people. They have an extraordinary history, um, and their culture is absolutely fascinating. Their music is marvelous. Uh, but their ritualistic beliefs and their religious beliefs are, 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 are really quite something to experience. And once every five years, and I'm talking again back in the 70s, once every five years, there was the tradition that you would need to honor the great spirit of the tribe that lived in a sacred lake. And the name of this lake is Fundutsi. So once every five years, they have this, this, this big ceremony down at the lake where they pour offerings, usually homemade um beer made made of uh, essentially of cornmeal ground cornmeal which is allowed to ferment and um, and 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 other uh, other uh, vegetable products and leaves and whatever else that they pour into the lake as an offering to the great spirit who supposedly has a sort of python um, form to to either him, her, or it, whatever you wish to think of it. And once every five years, and the oldest, one of the oldest members of the tribe officiates at the ceremony. And we were very fortunate to be able to film one of these. Now, my, my anthropologist, who was my host in the series, his name was Peter Becker, an amazing guy, who spoke a lot of the local black languages. He, 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 he learned them all. And um, he really knew his stuff. He was a terrific guy. He was my on-camera host for the series. And we were given permission to go down to the Sacred Lake with a group of people who all were dressed in their tribal, uh, uh, their tribal dress, rattles and grass skirts, beads, colorful, amazing. And these people are, are, you know, have very uh, strong f features. They really are wonderfully, wonderful, good-looking people, both male and female. And um, so we go down to the lake to do the ceremony. And the, the old priest who was going to officiate was a guy who was well over 100 years old. Um, he was eventually brought in. And, you know, we asked him questions. Of course, he right. spoke no, no English, but we had translators. And, you know, we asked him many questions. And, and his answers proved that, you know, he, rem he remembered things as a boy, as a child. Oh. And all of it showed us very clearly that, you know, he was well over 100 years old. Um, anyway, um, this place is so sacred to that tribe that when you go down to the shores of this lake, which is in the middle, which is down in the middle of a valley, which is really difficult to get to, steep banks and inclines, very difficult, lots of thorns and bushes and trees on the way. Um, but when you get down to the bottom, you need to take your shoes off in the same way as you do in many Oriental cultures, out of respect for the spirits, because almost echoing the biblical command, you know, like to Moses, take thy shoes off thy feet for the land upon which thy walk is holy ground, said God to Moses. Well, the same thing applied to these people. When you get down to the bottom of the lake, you, you take your shoes off, you walk around barefoot out of respect. It's holy ground. And we did this. And and uh, anyway, Peter, my host, you know, took his shoes off, of course, walking around. And there were a lot of pebbles and stones and, you know, thorns. And he stubbed his toe on one of the pebbles and you know he hurt his toe and he was sort of hobbling around now the ceremony has is, is has got underway at that point and this ancient old man this withered old guy was looking out towards the lake with his hands held up high above his head peering out over the lake and he was chanting away in, a, in this voice sort of wow chanting to the spirit of the lake thanking the ancestors and the creators of the tribe for protecting the tribe. And here's Peter in front of my camera with this going on in the background with all these people in their tribal dress and that remarkable old man. And Peter's hobbling around on one foot, you know, saying, ouch, ouch. And one of my assistants um, started to giggle. Um, and it was like, it was infectious. You know what happens when people start giggling. Absolutely, you know, but oh my gosh, what timing. You know, spreads around the room instantly, right? So yes. everybody's howling with laughter. Well, that's what happened to us, we all started to, we couldn't control ourselves. We started, started to laugh, to giggle and laugh. Now, that wasn't the way to behave at all. We are partaking in an ancient ceremony. We should have had far more respect than that, but we couldn't help ourselves. We were all sort of trying to stifle our laughter and, you know, sneering and giggling and we're laughing. And this old man, 
he, he was half blind and half deaf. He couldn't possibly have heard us. But he stopped his chanting. He stopped looking out towards the lake with his hands up like this. And he turned around and looked at us. Those eyes, they really, they, they, they couldn't see very much. They were that old. But he looked at us when we knew that he was watching us with some kind of real anger. And as that happened, and remember, this is the days of film and tape. We're running film and we're running tape decks recording all of this. The minute he turned around to look at us, the camera stopped running. The tape recorded, the, the Niagara professional tape deck stopped working. Everything electronic that we were using stopped dead, stopped working. And I looked at Peter, my anthropologist, and I said, oh, my, I have what's going on? And Peter looked at me. We all stopped laughing at that point, of course, because this is serious stuff. We're missing the, the heart of the ceremony. We right. can't film it. Everything's jammed. Nothing's working. What's going on? So I, I, I called one of my assistants over. I said, for God's sake, please go and ask the, 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 the head tribesman over there, the headman from the, from, the, from the local village, to please go and speak to the priest and ask him whatever happened to please, you know, whatever was done to undo it, if it was possible. And that was done. You know, they ran away and they went down to this, this old guy and whispered into his ear, came running back to us and said, the priest said that the ancestors are unhappy about your behavior and you are not being allowed to photograph the ceremony. Wow. You know, my assistant, we had a, a voltmeter there, you know, of course, which you carry. Every good assistant has a camera. Does the battery work? Yeah, there's power. Is, is, is there power going through the cables? Yes, there's power. Is there power going to the tape deck? Yes, there's power. Everything had power, but nothing was running. Nothing was working. I mean, I knew, we all knew, and Peter said, the spirits are, 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 are jamming us. They're not allowing us to shoot something metaphysical something in the supernatural world is stopping us from allowing us to do what we have to do down here if we were panic station so i said to the assistant again i said please take our apology go back to the old man and apologize most profusely and ask him to apologize to the ancestors on our behalf we really are very very sorry we're very apologetic for our behavior please forgive us for what we what we did we didn't mean to offend anybody and he went back to the old guy and the old guy, you know, sort of nodded his head, this very old man. And he sort of, you know, wobbly, he turned around, looked back at the lake, lifted his arms to the lake again and started to continue with his chanting. And as he did so, immediately the tape deck starts to run, the camera <laughs> starts to run, everything is <laughs> <sorry. laughs> Well, I guess he showed you. <laughs> oh, my uh, goodness. You know. Go figure that out. So I don't know if that was your problem at the beginning of the show, but well, I, I wasn't understand. familiar with any spirits that were here, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't but, see any reason why anybody should have been jamming you. But anyway, whatever did you unjammed it? You got it right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I, I, I use a specific microphone, but the connection cables for them are specific to that brand. You cannot use anything else. So uh -huh. when you commented before we started that you had heard a, a sound, I was like, well, I'm not hearing that. Well, while we were trying to get everything working, I did. And mm -hmm. the um, I never, ever have used like a gaming headset you know, with the little mic up made yeah. into it or whatever and that's what i'm using tonight because i am on the road and this is not my home computer base <laughs> so okay. but thank goodness and i don't know well i do know why because i get things that happen like that and i always go i don't know why that happened but because i i knew that it would i had tossed this little gaming headset into my computer bag, the one that I travel yeah. with. Well, you see, the spirits were helping you so because they, they were helping me. That. They and told you to do that. <laughs> when I was looking, when I was looking during the break, the um, prong that goes into the microphone is bent. Ah, there you go. So it must have happened during the travels. Um, but actually, yep. I was interviewed on Friday and I used it and it worked well. So I obviously mm. did something to it, but yep. didn't know it. So yeah. The 
these Weird. things happen. Yeah, they do. Happen. Yep. We have to yep. take this break. I have, I'm sorry, but we were going to come back. We have um, other things that we want to talk about too. But yes, isn't that strange? But no, just no angry spirits here that I'm aware of. I'm going to try to keep it that way too. So we will be right back. Y'all come back too. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Kat Hobson Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcast. The best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see the spirits will talk to you. And the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio with my guest, Lionel Friedberg, and I am having the best time with him. And now we have got questions going out the wazoo. And we have, um, a lot of them we have answered, but do you mind a couple of them? Sure, go ahead. Fantastic. What is your favorite country that you visited or lived in? Uh, well, I mean, I'm I'm now 100% American. I, I've, I'm now an American citizen, and I think of myself entirely as an American. But but the essence of Africa and the mystery, the mystique, and the antiquity of Africa, and having grown up on that continent remains with me for all time. I, I'm not sure if this applies to folks from other parts of the world. You know, people go from one part of the world to the other and, you know, may make new homes everywhere. We've been doing that for a long, long time. And, you know, but 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 Africa really is the my birthplace. That's where I come from. It's a continent that defined me. And some of the most extraordinary experiences that I've ever had in my life took place there. And the essence of that continent and its antiquity, its the ancient nature of Africa and its extraordinary versatility, v- variety, is what courses through my veins. And that's part of why I called my book 
forever in my veins. Yes. But there's a double meaning to that uh, title because yes. what also lies in my veins is a quest to find the truth. You've got to keep searching. You've got to keep finding out. You've got to keep going from horizon to horizon. You never get to the end. It is a constant adventure. And the other thing is that what I, for me, is that what runs very, very deeply in my blood is the magic of film. Because film was the means that took me into all of these unbelievable adventures that I've had in my life. So it refers to many things. But to answer your, your, your listener's question, my, I think what I found the most fascinating country that I visited was India, and particularly South India. I always wanted to go and visit the, the ancient temples of Hindu India. And my wife and I eventually went out there. She's been to other parts of India. She's been to North India, Central India. I think the whole of India must be absolutely fascinating. But I was always really drawn to South India. Um, maybe it has something to do with the past life. I think it might well have. But I'm very, very attracted to the culture and to the the spiritual beliefs of the Hindu people, you know, about, about being um, respectful to all forms of life. Uh, uh, about, um, you know, just being humble and about um, just the way you go about your world, the sort of things that you put up, put on your plate. You, you know, uh, uh, I like the concept of, you know, if you can be, be, be careful about what you eat. It, 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 it defines who you are. There's a, there is the saying you are what you eat. And I totally be believe that. And so, you know, I tend towards this whole concept of vegetarianism because not only is it healthier, but I think it's it's good for one's karma. It's good for one's vibes. It just, you know, yeah, they used to feed troops, the Roman troops at night, you know, steak because it gives you it gives you vitality and it makes, you know, it gives you that kind of stamina. And um, the Hindus knew this. So I was anyway attracted very much to to southern India, and I wanted to visit some of those really, really, really ancient temples that exist there. I've been to Egypt as well, and uh, which was absolutely amazing. But India for me was, it was like someone had taken a, 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 a huge palette of paint and turned it upside down and turned, spilt all of these colors, this variety of colors onto a huge canvas. Because that's what India really all is all about. It's this incredibly eclectic, colorful mix of everything imaginable. In one day, you can see the entire spectrum of life from birth to death, from poverty to extreme wealth, from beauty to unbelievable ugliness. You know, and I love the music and I love their culture. I think that the dance and 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 that the music of southern india has within it and something that really resonates with me very very deeply uh, i love the sound of gongs and bells and silence the smell of incense the fact that people go into a humble home where they don't have very much but there is always a little lamp burning to show that there is light in the world you know i love all that stuff and I india love that. Pretty, yeah and that's what india for me was all about in one day you see it all it is an amazing place and the people are just fabulous they're absolutely wonderful folks i mean uh, i don't know about the rest of the country i'm quite sure it's, it must be very much like the south but i had the time of my life we were there for over a month we rented a car my wife and i and we drove everywhere and part of the journey was broken up where we took a train i always wanted to experience an indian train and i've heard all these horror stories about going by rail in India. Well, I wanted to experience that, you know, the crowds, the, the chaos. And yes. it was amazing. It was just wonderful. I loved every minute of it. So uh, the journey was broken up by this wonderful rail journey. And then we uh, had another car, a different driver. And, you know, every day the driver would go out and pick some flowers and buy a fruit, a lemon or a lime or, a, or a, some whatever local fruit and tie it to the to the to the grill of the car or to the rear view mir mirror because that would bring freshness that would bring energy that would be the bring the essence of nature into the car i love that kind of concept it was just marvelous i i love that place well it it's a beautiful description because now i want to go so oh. <laughs> and i actually have um some buddhist priests that i'm familiar with i haven't uh, seen them in a little while who 
came out of Tibet and you know, ran to India. And one of them is now here teaching um, Buddhist Buddhist cultures you know, at a yeah. at a mm-hmm. university. Uh-huh. And he has found a way to educate people and lead them you know, help lead them toward enlightenment. And right. I just think that's wonderful. But oh, we cool. have a couple of other questions, and this is going to take us into one that um, I was actually going to say for last, but we have a question about it. Yeah. So she says that um, many people call those ancient societies, creation stories, myths, or myth them. And do you believe they're myth or that there might be some truth to those stories and strange creatures? The creation stories? Mm-hmm. Are we referring to uh, biblical stories, or what is she referring to? Well, I am pretty sure that she studies everything, mm-hmm. but I believe that this would be referencing biblical stories. Am I right? Yeah. Because she is, she's a quick typist when she's yeah. at the keyboard. But I would assume so. And you know what happens when you assume. Yeah, that well... Well, let me let me let me let me try and look at it this way. You know, I I, I wrote the show uh, Who Wrote the Bible because I was supervising producer of a, of a series of shows which ran for four seasons. I was on the series Who Wrote the Bible. We told lots of biblical stories um, from the Old Testament and the New Testament. One day we were having a story conference uh, at the production company here in L.A. and and, and on the line to the network in. Um, in, 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 in Washington. Uh, um, uh, and, um, you know, we were just talking about new stories to develop for the series. And, and, and I said, you know, we've done all these amazing tales, stories. Why don't we do uh, a show that looks at the Bible itself? Who wrote it? Yes, everybody. Let's do that. Let's do one called Who Wrote the Bible? Who's going to write it? You know, which one of your writers do you want to do that? And I said, I'd like to do it myself. So it was agreed that I would go off and write that show myself. And I went away and after, you know, it didn't take long for me to realize uh, that there was no way that I could do justice to a subject like that in one hour. And I went back to the, uh, to the, to the, to the studio who went back to the network and I, you know, and we said, look, an hour isn't going to cut it. Not on this subject. We need more. Is there any way we can get a two hour special to do this, and the network sort of hummed and hard, and uh, you know, um, and by the way, the producers were really angry with me because I was breaking, you know, the, the rules. So you don't do that. Um, but they requested it from the network, and the network eventually came back with the answer. Where they were really understanding and very kind, and they said, "Sure, okay, let's do that as a special, as a two-hour special. Go and do it." So off I go, and well, would you believe? It didn't take me long to realize that even two hours. Right. It was not, not going to get me close to even scratching the surface of that story. And I went back to the, st- to the studio and I thought that I was going to get fired. I really did. I, they, 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 just, they looked at me and they said, oh, no, not again. And I said, yeah. <laughs> I, I said, can we get another hour out of this? <laughs> and the, the executive, you know, I thought he was going to throttle me. And he said, well, let me check it out with the network, which he did. And would you believe the network agreed? And so they agreed to do it as a Sunday afternoon special, a three-hour special called Who Wrote the Bible? And so I went away and I wrote this uh, show. And it was a really, very tough job to do because there's no way that one can really do justice to a subject as enormous as that. Uh, How many books are there in the Bible? 48 or whatever it is. It's incredible. And, you know, where did they all all come from? And who wrote what and when and where? When you get to the New Testament, there's almost a paper trail that you can kind of follow. The Gospels, you can sort of follow it. Uh, the Old Testament gets a little more difficult because how many, where are the records? Who kept what? Where do they come from? But when you get to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Torah. Yeah. those are tough to do. Because there really is, n- there's no evidence, there's nothing that you can go to as your source material uh, other than what we have. And of course, when one looks at the Bible, you've got to realize that it's been translated so many times over so many centuries, you know, and it all began originally as Hebrew and was then translated into 
Aramaic and it then became Greek and then it became Latin and then it became Old English and then it became this kind of English and now you've got modern English. How much do you lose on the way through all these translations? Well, you lose a lot and not only that, but there were many books of the Bible that were removed once it was finally decided which books finally went into the Bible at the Council of Nicaea. And um, a lot of books were thrown out, like the book, Book of Enoch. Yes. And, you know, I tell you, for folks who are interested in UFOs and extraterrestrials and aliens and whatever else, the Book of Enoch is full of stories that are straight up their alley, you know. Absolutely. It's It's what started Eric Brandonikin on his path. Yeah, I mean, it's about intergalactic warfare. It's about, you know, wars between species from different planets. You go to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, that amazing temple in the jungle. Oh, it's beautiful. And you, you, that's where we get the whole idea of vimanas, these flying craft mm-hmm. that are part of all of those stories that are carved into the walls of this amazing temple. You know, so it's difficult. It's hard um, to know what to make of all of this. But isn't it interesting that when you read Genesis, and maybe this answers your listeners' question to some extent, you know, at the very beginning it says, at the beginning, you know, after creation, there were giants in the land. Yes. And the sons of, 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 of the gods, you know, took the wives of men, you know. And so what are we talking about here? Are we talking about mythological beings or are we talking about something else? Now, a lot of people who believe that we've been visited many, many times by alien species and And I'm one of them, but I'm not going to go there uh, because without prefacing it with a lot of other stuff, because this is sensitive stuff. But I certainly believe that, you know, we've been we're not alone in the universe. And we've been we've been visited by extraterrestrials for a long, long time. And who knows, maybe there has been some bioengineering going on. Erich, Erich, um, uh, at least uh, Zachariah Sitchin writes extensively about that in his books, you know, about the Anunnaki. And, but that's just another one of the many, many examples that one can look at. So, um, you know, and also there are, there are discrepancies in Genesis. In one part, it says Noah takes into the ark, the animals two by two, and not very far away, just a few pages away. There's another passage that says Noah takes into the, it was told to take into the ark animals seven by seven. So, not only are we seeing some, you know, contradictions going on, but you can see a different style of writing going on. And serious biblical scholars can identify the work of three different authors in the book of Genesis. And I don't mean to denigrate the Bible. That's the last of my intentions. I think the most important thing, by the way, about the Bible is not about where it came from and who wrote it and all that stuff, but who reads it and what is the purpose of reading it. And if the Bible teaches one humility, and if the Bible teaches one to be decent to your neighbor, and to love your neighbor, and to be tolerant of others, and to be respectful, that's really what it's all about. And to be respectful of the fact that we are not alone, and that there is something above us. Think of it whatever you like. I don't think it's an old guy sitting on a cloud looking down at us, you know, but there certainly is a super intelligence that is behind everything. And the Bible makes you respect that fact. For those who believe that, you know, Jesus was the son of God, that's fine and it's wonderful. And I totally respect that. And it has created one of the most uh, amazing religions on earth. And I totally respect all of that. But I think we really need to look deeper into all of these things. Um, And not only that, but when you look at ancient texts, like from Sumeria, that part of the world, which is where, you know, Babylon eventually was established, that sort of area, which is now Iraq and so on. Yes. That, that, that is an amazing part of the world. And those old texts, many of them on clay tablets and these uh, other documents that are kept in museums like in Berlin and some were kept in Baghdad and a few in Paris and there are a few in the British Museum. You know, they, they speak they speak of... They talk about legends. They're, 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 there's a story there about called the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is yes. exactly like the story of Noah and the Ark. Yes. 
So which came first? Who was borrowing from who? And what's the real truth? Or is it all true? And what do we take from it? Well, as far as I'm concerned, what I take from it is just keep looking and investigating and digging deeper until you find the truth. But in the meantime, respect what's out there and respect what exists and respect the fact that other people have their belief systems and you've got to respect that. Yes. And that, that has been a guiding principle of mine all my life. Well, it's all about balance. You know, yeah. everybody, everybody's ideas count the same. Precisely. And everybody gets their turn to share their ideas. Of course. So I agree with you. I think that's um, that's a good philosophy to live by. We have more questions. Um, something about reptilians. Let me find it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Do you know about Credo Mutwa who just passed away recently? Uh, of course, absolutely. Credo Mutwa was probably one of the most famous internationally known Sangomas in South Africa. Yes. He was unfortunately grossly overweight towards the end of his life. And he had, he studied, he suffered from, from, uh, um, from diabetes really, really badly, uh, towards the end of his life. And he died re uh, not very long ago, I think about a year ago, but Kreda Mutwa has written extensively on about Zulu legends and uh, Zulu history. His first book was called Indaba, my children. Indaba is a Zulu word that means let's meet, uh, having a meeting, let's get together and talk about stuff. So his first book was called Indaba, my children. And if anyone's interested in any of that really ancient African stuff, you know, try and find a copy of Indaba, My Children by Krida Mutwa. It's like a thousand pages. This guy wrote that. He's written many other books as well, but he was he was an extraordinary man. Uh, I never had the opportunity of meeting him, but everyone knew who uh, Krida Mutwa was. Well, that's, that's interesting because um, Dreamland in chat said that he was the leader who told of the reptilians who visited them in the far past. Yes, he did talk about that. Yeah. And, you know, um, Karina Butler also tells an, another really interesting story. You know, if you're a little guy growing up in the, in the boondocks in South Africa, um, w invariably what, what these little guys would do were, were to become shepherds, look out, looking after the, uh, either the sheep or the goats or the cattle. Uh, that's what they would do. Little boys would do that, you know, out in the tribal areas. And Krita Mutwa was a little shepherd, I, I think he was, you know, or, or a, a herds boy, looking after his father's cattle. Uh, up in the, the northern area of South Africa somewhere, which is where I think he, he grew up, although he really was essentially from, from the Zulu clan. And, and a very proud one at that. And by the way, the Zulu people are an amazing people with an amazing history. They had an empire. They had a leader by the name of Shaka who ruled huge tracts of territory in Africa uh, because they were so powerful. He was like the African version of Roman legions and the Roman army uh, during his time. We're talking about you know, a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but I'm digressing. So Krita Mutwa, when he was a little boy, he, one day he actually he talks about this. And I think there is an interview with David Ick, I-C-K-E, right. uh, who follow him, uh, where he was being interviewed. And he said that um, he came across um, a UFO and uh, um, a, a, a spacecraft that was there in, in the bush and that he was abducted. The term he used was, I think he, he used the term invited and not abducted inside the spacecraft and that he was examined by these beings. They were almost human-like in many ways. They could have been greys, they could have been white, so they could have been one of many others that people, you know, are familiar with, those who follow, you know, the UFO culture. Um, and he said uh, they examined him and um, he, uh, he spent, a, he wasn't sure how long it was, but he spent quite a long time inside this craft and eventually he was released, he was unharmed. And he said after that, he started developing all these intuitive powers and he had great insight into the tribe and into the history of his people as a result, he said, of that experience. And um, he is of the opinion that the reptilians are only one of many, many alien species who have visited the Earth and that the reptilians may be one of the baddies. There are lots of different and I and I and I and I tend to agree with this 
uh, whole thinking that there are many different species that have been visiting the earth over a period of perhaps millions of years. And the reptilians are perhaps not the nicest ones. And I they would may agree with what I, from what I've heard. And they may still be around. And, you know, I mean, I've even heard tales about reptilians are shapeshifters and, they, you know, they even take the form of humans. Do I have proof of that? No, I do not. But I certainly will listen to all of this stuff. I love going to UFO conferences, by the way. I and I you. love going. There's an <laughs> event that happens once every year uh, near Palm Springs called Contact in the Desert. Yes, I was and there the any, last one they held. For anybody who is into any of this alternative stuff, that's the place to go. Yes, it, it is. is. Absolutely wonderful. How long is it, uh, Kat? Four or five days, right? Yes. And well, it's three days total, but I mean, as far as the speak speakers and lectures, four to yeah, four yeah, days. Yeah. Yeah. But you go there it's and wonderful. You hear, you hear all these amazing people who come from all over the world, the Graham Hancocks of the world, the Erich von Dunnikens of the world. That's where know, I met him. And lots of others. They come there and they talk about these things and they explore these things. And I think it's very important that people do have the opportunity of looking into all this stuff. Because I really do think it's time to rewrite the history of the human race. And I, I really think it's time to rewrite the history of the world as we know it. And but, Contact but, in the Desert is one of the places where you get a lot of material that you that makes you think about stuff. And you can talk to people who have actually had their own experiences. But we have to take our last break. Sure. Because we ran over a little bit, but that's because I'm going to let this run over a little bit so that we can finish getting everything that we want out. So we'll be right back. Y'all come back too. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see the spirits will talk to you, and the world wide web of weird with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the final segment of Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am having the best time tonight learning and chatting with my guest, Lionel, excuse me, Friedberg. I have, yeah, we had kind of segued into the the alien conversation and we have mentioned how fabulous contact in the desert is for learning about these things. And it is now held in a resort, not at Joshua tree itself. So no scorpions. So you can wear open toed shoes as I was told by one of the speaker's wives and I took it to heart. So, um, you know, now that we have kind of broken the seal as it were on this topic, you had UFO experiences yourself. So do you want to talk about those? 
about that? I, did, I, was, I was in, I, I had emigrated to Canada. I was living in Canada. The year was 1966. And we were working on a documentary on the history of housing throughout Canada. Now, as most folks know, you know, most, most of the population in Canada live way down in the south, you know, above, just above the, the U.S. border. Um, that's where most of the cities are. The urban areas are strung across Canada like that. And then you have this huge territory to the north, which is not very uh, highly populated. Right. And what and what this documentary was about was how 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 housing areas or towns and cities, the reason why they are formed and why they grow. That was the nature, the, the subject matter of this particular documentary we were working on. And um, we were in the province of Saskatchewan. And we were going to film at a potash plant. Now, potash is mined in Saskatchewan. I think, if I remember correctly, and I don't want to sound, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think potash is used in, 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 in um, uh, either um, uh, um, fertilizer products and, and so on. It's, it's, it's a white material that is mined out of the ground. And when they mine it, it's in an open cast sort of mine and it makes huge plumes of white dust and smoke. So we were going to film at this plant because the plant was the reason why a, a town was forming on the perimeter of the mine here in the middle of Saskatchewan. It was a very small crew, only three of us on that little show. Um, and so we stayed at a motel that night and Saskatchewan is really flat, you know, absolutely like a draft board tabletop, flat. Oh. Wow. Corn fields, no mountains, no valleys. It's stuck flat. You can drive for miles, and you know you don't don't even find a bump in the road. Amazing, um, from horizon to horizon. So we left our motel early this particular morning, driving towards this potash plant, and of course we could see the plant way up ahead of us, you know, at the horizon because there was this plume of dust, white dust, going up from the ground and then hanging in the air, like you know, just sitting up the, in the air like a big almost like a mushroom cloud, if you like. And, you know, after a couple of hours of driving, we eventually get to the plant. And um, when we got to the gate, the, the, the guard at the, at the gate says, you, you guys get down to that parking lot um, and, 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 and take a look up because there's something sitting up in that white cloud up there. And, you know, I, I wasn't directing the show. The director said, what do you mean? You know, he said, well, we don't know what it is, but there's something up in that white cloud. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So we go down we stop in the parking lot the director had to get on with the business of the day which was meeting the manager of the plant to discuss the filming but i set up the camera in the parking lot and um a couple of the other guys who worked at the plant came over to me you know just shooting the breeze smoking away and you know chatting with me and i set up the camera with the longest or, or the most powerful lens that we had and i think the longest lens that we had was something like a 300 millimeter which was yes quite powerful quite powerful um, and, uh, you know, again, it's film and it's, this was 16 millimeter film, not 35 millimeter, uh, like we used to shoot, you know, uh, not on the, on the Hollywood stages, the 16 mil and a 300 millimeter, millimeter lens is pretty powerful. And I put that on the camera and I looked up at the cloud and just out of curiosity to see if I could see anything. And, uh, there was, there was no, no wind that day, nothing. And there, we just, you know, sat around chatting. And then a little breeze came up and this dust sort of began to clear up in the air. And my goodness, up there was a hint of metal, which was clear. You could see that. Wow. And one of the guys said to me, there it is, there it is, there it is. And I sort of, you know, trained the lens on it, managed to get some focus going and turned on the camera. Um, and then the, the breeze intensified a little bit and that cloud cleared enough for me to see what was a large silver like disc just sitting there underneath it was a tr uh, was what looked like a triangle and with three beams like a tripod connecting back to the disc strange oh my gosh i have never heard of a craft like that a strange very strange <clears throat> uh, device now people have often asked well how big was it um it was big these were before the days of the big twin aisle jumbo jets like the Boeing 747, but it probably was the size of, of, of that kind of aircraft. It was huge sitting up there, not making a sound, just sitting there, not a window to be seen, not a sign on it, nothing, just a silver sheen. And I ran film. I must've run about a 
150 feet of film. You know, that's a lot. And um, <laughs> at the end of it, you know, uh, I turned off the camera. Nothing was happening, so I turned off the camera. And then the breeze came, and eventually this, this craft got covered up again by the white cloud. And uh, that was it. I took the lens off, and we got on with the business of the day, which was filming at the plant. And at the end of the day, we go back to the motel, and it was my job um, – can up the film, to get the film out of the magazine, out of the camera, put each roll of film into a separate can, identified with a label, put a list on it, what we used to call a camera sheet, and send that uh, back to Montreal for processing in the lab and to await our return, which was some weeks later. And, you know, a few weeks later, we eventually get back to Montreal and uh, one particular day was the day to go and look at all this footage that we'd shot across the country. A lot of boring footage about boring towns, uh, but that's what the you know that's what 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 the, the film was about. You know, just towns growing up and existing out there in the middle of nowhere and cities and whatever else. Nothing really exciting. And at the end of you know sitting through a couple of hours more, uh, I would say you know half a day of looking at all of these dailies, the projectionist in the back said, "What about this other role here? Uh, this this short one? Uh, do you want me to put that on the projector as well?" And the, the head of the camera department said, uh, looked at me or looked at the director, said, what is it? And the director said, uh, I don't know what that is. And I said, that's the footage of that thing we saw in the cloud. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, the projectionist put it on and ran it and we saw it on the screen and it was as clear as a bell. There, there oh, was this, this object. Now, I have to tell folks that, you know, I don't know how many if people are familiar with the, the, the old days of using film. You either shot film which was a negative in the camera. And then when you got your negative, you either took it into a darkroom or a lab, and then you, you printed that onto positive stock. So you got a negative, which is your camera original, and then you got a positive print from that. Or Kodak made a wonderful type of film called a reversal film, which was, it, I think the term was Kodachrome. Oh, when you, okay, when yeah. you processed the film, what came out of the lab was, you could you could look at it. It was in its positive form already. You didn't have to print it. It was, it was uh, it was positive. It was already viewable, and that's how we used to shoot slides for slide projectors and things like that. Um, and um, so the problem is with using that kind of film stock. And this was our downfall as to do with this particular event is because. We only had the positive print, uh, if you like, the camera original, which was viewable mm -hmm. of this object. And we decided, um, the, the, the head of the camera department, I think it was, or somebody in the audience said, why don't we send that down to the States to Project Blue Book? Um, they're doing research into stuff like this. Maybe they can identify it. And it was agreed that we would send it. And I know it was sent by some kind of courier service. I don't remember. I'm talking about you know, a million years ago. It's 1966, remember? Right. That the, 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 uh, the, the woman who ran the camera department, she was responsible for sending it off to Ohio. I think it went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And um, it was signed for. They did receive the film. And we didn't hear back. And, you know... Some more weeks went by, other projects go by. And eventually I went back one day to the camera department and I said to her, Frankie, her name was Frankie Johnson. I said to her, Frankie, did we ever hear back from those, those guys in the States about that footage of that st strange thing that we, that was, you know, that was in that cloud? Oh no, I don't, I don't think we'd heard back. She said, um, and I said, well, can we find out? She said, yeah, I'll call them. Um, I got, I've got their number. And, you know, she looked at the time zone difference and she said, I can call them now. And she calls and, uh, to her shock and dismay, she puts the phone down and she said they deny receiving it. They deny even anything, knowing anything about the film. It's as though they didn't receive it. But we know that they signed for it because we have proof that it was received by them. Right. And now that they're in denial that they even got the footage. So you hear so many stories about there being cover-ups about that kind of stuff. And this was a typical example of them denying, them being whoever the authorities were, that these things didn't exist. Well, that craft did exist because we filmed it. Right. And they denied, they denied having any film of it at all. So, you know, one wonders how much of the stuff that has happened over the years has been hidden from public knowledge. You know, it was only recently 
I don't know if folks remember this, but recently there was some footage that was released to the networks by the Navy off the coast of uh, San Diego from the USS Nimitz. There were two um, F-16s doing uh, aerials, an aerial exercise over the Pacific, and they saw this UFO and uh, they filmed it. It's, it's, they're, they're, there's actual film that they have, uh, not film, it's video. And it was released to the to the networks. It was on YouTube. It was on the television network. It was on the news. And this was not very long ago. This was maybe six months ago. The fact that that kind of stuff is now being released to yes. the mass media may be an indication that maybe disclosure one day is not too far away. Maybe somebody somewhere is going to say, listen, we have to tell folks what's really been going on. You know, maybe we have been visited by alien craft for a long, long time. And maybe there are even um, bodies that can, you know, everyone knows the story of Roswell and that everyone knows that, you know, bodies were found. But of course, the Air Force and so on covered it up by saying, oh, no, it was a weather balloon. No, there were no bodies, da, 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 da. Well, is that the truth or not? And maybe the time is coming close now where we will be told the truth. I would hope so. I hope so because you know the the whole thing was that up until somebody panicked, they were very upfront and honest. You know, we have a UFO. We have a we have a flying disc. Right. For twelve hours. Right. The next morning, all of a sudden, it had a you know devolved into a weather balloon. Well, you, just you aluminum said, foil, basically. You said earlier that you met the guy from the the, the name of the movie was Fire in the Sky. What was his name? Uh, um, Travis. Travis. Yeah, Walton. Travis Walton. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean Travis Walton. His experience. Uh, he he he. You know, he's absolutely. I don't doubt for one second what this guy says. Me I've either. met him too. And you know, he talks about uh, and these 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 beings that um, he encountered inside the spacecraft. Um, I think this was in Arizona, wasn't it? Yeah, Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, uh, were not in any way uh, belligerent. They they obviously didn't mean him any harm. Uh, he was zapped by uh, some kind of a ray that came out of this flying machine, and when he woke up, he was inside the craft. Yeah. And these these beings were bending over him, and he said they meant no harm. I think they were trying to heal me, to help me, because I was probably I probably have a heart attack from this 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 ray, this beam, whatever it is that zapped me. Yes. And I believe that they were trying to, you know, um, to, to fix me. And then I was released. You know, the movie that was made about that fire in the sky told yes. it from the opposite point of view, that they were hostile and, you know, he was terrified and on and on. You know, maybe these beings really don't mean us any harm. And I think it's time that we, you know, open up, put out a, the welcome card and get to know them and tell folks what's going on. Well, I think so, too. Yeah, you know, what I found interesting when... You know, talking with Travis about that is that he was so. He's a very quiet man. Yes, as he a is. rule. Yes. That, you know, he thought he felt like he had died. He felt like they had killed him, and that. That's you right. know, They didn't kill him, but the wash from their craft did, yeah. and that um, that they took him aboard simply to save him because his friends were in the truck. That's right. Where I mean, if. Travis could see them. I'm sure that they, the beings were aware of them as well. They didn't yeah. take them. No. And, um, but he said that when he woke up, that he was um, aggressive toward them. And they left rather than upset him more. Yeah. So I thought that was, and, and then came back presenting as more human looking like Nordics. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. But I have one last question in, in here for you that I want to get to because this is the person that I had told that you were interested in biblical and ancient texts and such. Mm -hmm. But um, have you heard any prophecy for the coming years about anything? Yeah, I hear all sorts of stories about uh, lots of things, as I'm sure most folks do, who, anybody who who's interested in alternative stuff, you know, who go outside the box as I do all the time. You hear a lot of things and I'm hearing 2023 is a significant year and that's, you know, the end of times is, is nigh and it's only two years away. 
I take I will listen to all of these um, so-called prophecies. I will listen to everybody's theories. I will not take any of them seriously unless I am absolutely satisfied that there is enough proof to satisfy me that it's not just um, hearsay or based on empty whatever it is that they're basing these prophecies on. Um, so I will listen to a lot of them. But, you know, do I think that we are now on the verge of the end of times, that the end of the world is near? No, I do not. I do not. And um, in fact, I think that we're probably at the beginning of a time of enlightenment, but we have to go through some degree of darkness in order to enlighten us. And maybe that's what the COVID pandemic is all about, is to push us towards the light. I think darkness is one of the forces of the universe that exists to push us towards the light, to push us towards becoming enlightened beings, to push us towards becoming more, uh, you know, more peaceful beings. And the only way to do that is to be pushed in that direction. That's the, that's the purpose of darkness. That's the purpose of even evil, if you like. It's, it's, it's there not to destroy, but to push us towards an enlightened place or phase or era. And who knows when that is going to be. But let's be open to listen to all their theories. And let's be open to listen to everybody's point of view. I don't dismiss them outright. And I certainly wouldn't be rude enough to say, you're talking a lot of bunkum and junk and don't tell me this kind of stuff. I will listen to folks. But I don't swallow it all. I'm not gullible enough to believe unless there's some degree of proof. As you should be. I mean, as you, as you should not be gullible enough you know i (laughs) am that came out completely backwards but i am so so interested in all of your work and all of your experiences we could go on for hours and hours and i've i really look forward to hosting you on paranormal experienced in the near future but when you say that um that that darkness's purpose is to lead us forward. And you had spoke about, you know, your interview with, with Hitler's pilot. Do you feel that, that Hitler served that purpose as well? No, it was one of, that's, that's an except that kind of darkness doesn't do that to you. But what it does do to the victim is to push the victim to realize that there isn't only, you know, I think it's about there isn't only bad stuff in the world, that there's hope, at, that there's light at the end of the tunnel, that even though mass murder takes place, and all we have to do is look at the world headlines at any time, look at any African country or a lot of countries in the Middle East, these dreadful wars that go on, and, you know, look at what's going on in Afghanistan. Are these wars and are this is this violence teaching us anything Um, other than the fact that peace is so essential that even though it may seem very, very obscure, I think no matter how dark and how awful and how terrible things may be, there is a lesson to be learnt in all of that. And somehow or another, even though we are the victims, I I lost my grandparents, by the way. Uh, My father's father's mother was a victim of, of, uh, of Hitler, you know. Oh, my. Died in the Holocaust, and so did his family. Does that make me anti-German? Absolutely not. Um, is there a, So maybe there's a lesson in that. You learn not to be judgmental. And no matter how horrible these things are, there is a lesson in everything that we encounter in life and in the world. And the journey, you know, is more about discovery than it is about um, revenge and being fearful and, you know, allowing the darkness to take control of your life. Thank you for that. And I'm sorry about your family. But that was the story of so many. You know, the that's why that's why I have no interest in ever going to Auschwitz or anywhere else of its of its kind because I have a friend who is a psychic who went there and you know, he had to be carried out on a stretcher. He couldn't cope with it. Yeah, because I know it was feeling. so overwhelming. I know the feeling well. You know, I went to the killing fields in Cambodia. You know about the yes. during the the Khmer Rouge during Pol Pot's regime, 
uh, in Cambodia, the killing fields. I actually, my wife and I were in Cambodia and we went to the killing fields and you walk around and it's a very, very, very peaceful place. And there is a mountain of skulls in a, in, in a, in a, in a glass building that extends, I don't know how many stories high of oh thousands, God. thousands of skulls of people who, who were put to death at that very spot. And today all you hear is birds and there are butterflies fluttering around from flower to flower and the leaves and the grass is green and there's shade and there are lovely trees, you know, but children who had their heads smashed open on, 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 on this. There's one tree there that is put aside where people come and they actually hang little trinkets in the, on, on it as a remembrance where children had their, their brains bashed out by, by, the, by, by uh, the, the um, perpetrators of this awful regime. And you come away from a place like that and you really feel as though you are drained, as though you have been polluted by darkness, by badness, by evil, by energy that is you just want to get rid of it. You want to take a shower and get rid of it. And it's true. It can affect you easily. And um, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I in my book, I talk about an illness that I developed and how yes. the Sangomas helped me to overcome that illness. In fact, I was even given an exorcism in a, in a little country called Swaziland in South Africa, where a Sangoma actually regurgitated, re, re, vomited after he smelt my kidneys. He, he knew he didn't know that I had a kidney disease. He smelt me on my, the side of my body and he vomited into a barrel. And I was told later that he had taken all the dark energy out and got rid of it for me, you know. Wow. I mean, so, so, so darkness and energy and badness is 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 a reality, but it, it can affect you. And people must be very careful, particularly when you go to places like that. It can make you. It can really have an impact on you. Well, I, I'm a believer in that. Yeah. I agree. But I, it's so odd when you. It's like when you visit the battlefields through here from the Civil War. Right. You know, they're they're forested. You know, the actual killing fields there are still right. clear. Absolutely. You know, where they actually came into hand to hand combat and such. But the rest is grown up and it's it's beautiful. The I've investigated a couple of them and one of them my husband, who is, you know, as sensitive as a rock when it comes to that that type of thing, and never helps me investigate, said, "Why don't I get one of your recorders and come here so that you can triangulate this, and maybe you'll pick up exactly where the sound is?" Right. Because he was feeling it too, and he wanted to get answers. So yeah. it was really, it is very bizarre because some of the pieces places that have seen the most horrific things that humans can do to other humans are now calm and beautiful, <clears throat> but the energy is still there. Oh, yes. That Absolutely. Can, <clears throat> excuse me. That can take a good empath down. <laughs> yeah. Take a good psychic down. And for sure, because it's just, it, that part doesn't go away. That part doesn't mellow and become beautiful. Well, everything leaves an imprint. Every yes. single thing leaves an imprint. It's energy. Whether it's, whether it's good or bad, absolutely, energy is as real as this desk I'm sitting at right now. It exists, you know. Um, and I did work at the at the um, at Princeton University with a guy called Robert John, who wanted to find out, you know, what is what is consciousness? What what is it? Uh, uh, it, it, does it have, can you move objects with your mind only and things of that nature? And they prove time and time again that that even consciousness, even thought has energy to it and yes, it does. actually can have a physical impact on things. And it does. And it leaves an imprint. People go into a house and say, Oh, I don't like this room. Yeah. Well, maybe something yeah. bad happened there. There's a reason the for that. The imprint is there. Absolutely. And you know, that's to me, that's just fascinating. And it is. we have gone so far over the time for you. If you had plans, I know you need to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, thank you for having me so long. That's great. No, I've enjoyed it very much. Kat, well, thank you so much. It's been amazing. Well, I wasn't trying to ring you off, but I didn't know if you had plans for dinner because you are so far behind me in time there. <laughs> and I was just ruining your whole night. But. Thank you so much. I have enjoyed this conversation. I knew I was going to. Mm. And I just, 
I just appreciate you. I appreciate your time and your sharing of your experiences, taking the questions. I just, I appreciate you. Likewise, I thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure to be on your show. And I do hope folks get a chance to read the book because I think they'll all get something out of it. You know, you might just want to remind them it's forever in my veins and my philosophy and everything that I've been talking about. It's all in there. But yes. I think people can get some benefit out of that. There's more. There's so much more to the world as we know than, you know, we can ever imagine. And um, let's let's just move forward. Well, absolutely. You know, you you cannot stay stagnant and you can't go backwards. No. You know, no matter the situation, you have to keep plodding along and things tend to settle where they're supposed to be. Exactly. So, oh, and you are getting all kinds of kudos from chat. So thank you. And thank, thank you. And please thank, uh, on my behalf, I just, people are listening, still listening. Thank you, folks, for listening to me. I do appreciate and I appreciate all your, your, your input and your questions and the fact that you spent this time with Kat and I. I've enjoyed being with you all. Thank you. And we will catch up again. For Okay. I look for, forward to that. Me too. All right. For, you take care. You take care and stay safe. Huh? Thank you. You too. All right. Bye now. Goodbye. For everyone who is listening, whether you're live or through our multiple outlets for for um, archive, I would like to know um, if you have experiences yourself that you would like to share. If you have anything similar to share as well, and y'all are the reason that we do these shows. I am very blessed to have this platform. I am very blessed to have the listeners that that I do. And I know that every one of y'all support everything we do here at the network. I just want to make sure that tomorrow is going to be a big day. Tuesday is going to be a big day. Every day is a big day in some way, strength, form, or fashion. But if you don't like what you see, you can change that. Be the spouse that you would like to have. Be the friend you'd like to have or the, or the parent. And make sure when you're out and about that you are putting off positive energy. It's so easy to get taken down by somebody else's negative, And you're worth so much more than that. So just make sure that, um, that you value yourself and that you put out what you want to see. We can change this world. I have a shirt that says it, and my good friend, Corey, wrote a song about it. So <laughs> we can be the change. Take care. Thank you again. Find your peace place and just carry it with you. And you know, pray for our country and for society as a whole. We are pretty good people. We need to be reminded of that sometimes. Thanks again. See you next week. Same cat time, same cat channel. Good night.